Hi there, welcome to a second video looking at the issue of state ownership versus privatisation. It's a highly topical economics issue, remains so in policy circles, in particular uh, the entire question about the mix between state and private in different industries and different sectors. Quick reminder of two key terms. Uh, what do we mean first of all by nationalisation? Well, nationalisation is when there's a transfer of ownership of a business. It's when a government takes over a private sector company uh, so that the business is now wholly or majority state-owned and controlled. So, for example, in the UK context, Network Rail is the uh, state-owned, uh, commercially driven but state-owned uh, maintainer of the rail network, the stations, the signalling system and much else besides. So nationalisation involves a process of moving from private to public sector, whereas privatisation is the sale of state-owned companies back to the private sector. In other words, reverse nationalisation, and normally through a stock market listing, so for example the Royal Mail was part privatised in 2013, and then fully privatised in 2016, and the Royal Mail is now listed on the stock market. It's a publicly limited company with equity owned by many thousands, hundreds of thousands of shareholders. Now, this debate about privatisation and the reverse, nationalisation, continues to be quite important in, in the UK context and, of course, in many other countries as well. Under Labour uh, in the 2019 election in December 2019, Jeremy Corbyn and his shadow chancellor John McDonnell were proposing re-nationalisation on quite a big scale. Had they won, they would have re-nationalised the Royal Mail, uh, the rail operating companies, the train operating services, the energy supply networks and also the regional uh, water and sewage monopolies. Some people even wanted to go further and bring the commercial banks fully into state ownership. Situation we face at the moment, and recording this in February of 2021, is that the train operating companies, the majority remain private franchises, although the government, partly as a result of the pandemic, I believe has suspended uh, the issue of new rail franchises for the time being. However, London North Eastern Railway and Northern Rail are now state-run under an operator of last resort. As mentioned, the Royal Mail is now uh, fully privatised, operating in a highly contestable market, particularly when it comes to parcel deliveries. The water and sewage companies, that's a system of regional monopolies owned by the private sector in large part. And the energy supply networks, now well, that's remains an oligopoly, with uh, essentially dominant privately owned firms at both retail and wholesale level. So we have seen quite a degree of privatisation over the last, well, certainly 30, 35 years in the UK. That, that process has tailed off a little, in part because the big privatisations tended to happen during the 1980s and 1990s. The Royal Mail and tote betting are probably two recent examples of privatisation. Although... Uh, there is still some privatisation, at least on the agenda. Channel 4 is publicly owned, but commercially funded. <clears throat> they had revenues of just a shy under a billion pounds in 2020. Uh, pretty high revenues, actually, for, for this channel. Uh, but it's publicly owned. And there's an issue about whether Channel 4 might, might be privatised at some point in the future. And, of course, there's a wider issue about whether the private sector should build and maintain and operate things like uh, new prisons, build and operate new motorways and bridges and things. And uh, the Johnson government here, we're told, in June of 2020 is expected to press ahead with outsourcing the management of two new privately built prisons. So privatisation is still quite an important issue for students to be aware of. What I thought I'd do in this short video is just take you through some of the core arguments for and arguments against the privatisation of state assets and businesses. Now, there's quite a bit of text here on this slide, and do, do take a, a screenshot if you want to add that to your digital notes. So what are the core arguments for privatisation? Well, I guess fundamentally, it's a belief, uh, supporters of privatisation believe that market forces, the price mechanism, the signalling and the incentive functions of the price mechanism work, 
and that scarce resources are best allocated by the private sector. Linked with that is the idea or the belief that private companies owned by shareholders have a deeper, slightly stronger profit incentive to cut costs, to be more productively efficient, for example, by increasing labour productivity. You see these companies have to answer to their shareholders and uh, poor performance can be reflected in lower profits, reduced dividends and ultimately uh, a weaker share price. Uh, it's a one-off, but governments may well gain significant revenue from the sale of assets. Quite a few uh, developing, emerging countries, lower middle income countries, are privatising some of their assets. And uh, the money from the sale of those assets could help to reduce the size of the national debt. A fourth argument is that privatisation might help, could help, to create a wider share ownership, if you like, shared, a shareholder democracy, particularly if you give shares to a wide number of people. The Royal Mail, for example, uh, dispersed some of their new shares to their employees. And the argument there is that if you have employees who own shares, then again, that might give them a direct financial incentive to work and be productive and be successful in a business that they in part own. And there's a wider point, which is hard to prove. There must be loads of papers out there discussing it is that private sector firms are more likely to perhaps to be more dynamically efficient with uh, better records in innovation and also drive investment spending in an industry. And the argument there is that the private sector, who knows, if you're a train operating company, you're going to invest in your rolling stock. If you're a water monopoly, you'll have the profits to invest in reducing leaks and improving the, the efficiency of the network. What I've tried to do on this slide is give you an overview of some of the key arguments for privatisation? Well, of course, you'll have to evaluate. Uh, and the arguments against uh, run, broadly speaking, uh, as follows. First of all, uh, people who argue against privatisation are essentially arguing for state ownership, state control of a business or sector. Their first justification is that social objectives are given less prominence, less importance when a business operates purely for private profit. And if one thinks about key industries like water and electricity and telecoms and banking and mail services, then indeed there could well be some social aspects of a business which a government might want to emphasise. Some economists argue that some industries are best run by the state because they, are, they have a strategic importance. Defence industries, water and sewage supply, perhaps transportation. And some of these industries may have features of being a natural monopoly, which is where there's really only room for one firm to fully exploit economies of scale. Uh, if the government privatises a business, then the government and ultimately taxpayers may lose out on dividend payments from future profits. And there's also a case, for example, that when you sell off an asset to the private sector in their haste to privatise, some of these assets might be sold off too cheaply. The water companies, for example, in the late 1980s were handed to private sector companies almost free of debt, uh, which certainly helped them. The argument about wider share ownership is also criticised. Uh, indeed, often the shares are bought in bulk by big institutions such as pension funds and insurance funds. and They don't necessarily get a huge wide dispersion of share ownership. And also the idea that state-owned firms can be dynamically efficient too. Don't assume automatically, please, that the private sector is innovative and efficient and the state sector isn't. Mariana Mazzucati's important work on the entrepreneurial state suggests that many of the innovations that we take for granted these days, including GPS and things, actually came originally from public sector funding, not from the private sector. I suppose the argument against privatisation is that you may well end up by privatising or creating a monopoly. Uh, and a monopoly, of course, as this diagram shows, <coughs> has the potential to make huge supernormal profits at the monopoly price P1. At least under state control, the price could be low. You'd have more control over pricing, perhaps to the, to the wider benefit of the population. Well, what about some A-star evaluation perspectives? on the state versus the private sector debate. These are points that I think oftentimes you see from, from really top A-star students when they're trying to calibrate the arguments for and against privatisation. 
The first point I think is a, is an exceptional one, and that the, and that is that the ownership of a business, be it state or private, is probably less important than the extent to which a market or an industry is actually genuinely contestable. You see, if it's contestable, then actual competition and the threat of competition can influence the behaviour of a business, regardless of whether it's in the state or the private sector. The second evaluation point is that the quality on the impact of regulation is also important. A tough, strong, well-organised, well-informed industry regulator can act as a surrogate consumer and help to uh, help to drive efficiency and quality of service for people. So you can privatise a business, for example, uh, and but that's fine if you have a monopoly, but the, the monopoly can be regulated as well. Another point is to distinguish between network and final mile service. It might well be the case, for example, that you might want to have a, the network run by the state, such as Network Rail or the National Grid, and then have competition in the final mile service to the final consumer amongst competing service providers. I am quite clear that I, I don't like my students making lazy assumptions. And often in this debate, students tend to make quite lazy assumptions that the private sector is always almost taken as axiomatic that the private sector is always more efficient and innovative than the state. And yet we know that's not the case. And uh, my instinct is to, is to build arguments on a case-by-case -case basis and see where you get. And finally, a macroeconomic context is important. Uh, you may well have a domestic monopoly, and it doesn't really matter who owns it, but if they face intense competition from overseas, again, that is going to influence their behaviour, their decisions, going forward. So there we go. There are some of the key arguments for and against the privatisation of key industries. Okay, thank you very much indeed.